but I'm just going to ask you each to do a 30 second introduction if possible. So I'm going to come to you, Des, because you're top left on my on my screen. Just 30 seconds if you don't mind. Perfect. Sure. Hi, Des Ryan is my name. I'm the head of um, sports medicine and athletic development in Arsenal. So working with under nines, under 23s, we've got a, a pretty extensive sports science and medicine team. And I'm the guy to, to lead that team of people. Uh, before that, I worked for a good period of time in rugby. Uh, started off with Connacht Rugby and worked with the IRFU in the academies. I was lucky enough to train David Slemon. And he saw me, <laughs> my, my youthful, enthusiastic best, but also a raw conditioner. And he saw me make plenty of mistakes. So uh, <laughs> I've been working full time since about 1998 and really enjoy the whole world of strength conditioning and sports science. Cool. Thanks, Des. Next round the table is, is Chris. Thanks, Rob. Uh, you know, very uh, grateful to be invited on. So thank you very much. And um, I'll just say, Des, uh, youthful and, and enthusiastic was, was not how you described yourself off air a minute ago. <laughs> um, so uh, Chris Bishop, I um, run the master's degree in strength and conditioning at uh, the London Sports Institute Middlesex University. Um, I'm currently as well uh, the strength and conditioning coordinator for the uh, new sort of relatively newly formed NFL Academy uh, in London and uh, for my sins the current chair of the UKSCA as well. Thanks mate. Over to you David. Thanks Rob. So my name is Dave Sloan. Um, I am the founding partner of a company called Elite Performance Partners and we um, help recruit uh, performance staff, senior leaders into sports teams. So um, as Des alluded to, my first kind of career was in rugby. Um, the way he started that was as if I was going to throw him under the bus or something. And uh, I thought he was a pretty good coach, actually. But <laughs> um, yeah, in rugby. And then as I came out, moved into, as I guess a lot of people transitioning out of sports, didn't really know what to do, ended up in moving into headhunting. And then just spotted a bit of a gap in the market, really, for this, the process and rigor I'd seen in the corporate sector across different industries, different countries, I didn't see in sport. Um, and I didn't absolutely know that wasn't the case, but once I did some digging, didn't take long to realize that maybe there wasn't the same rigor generally. Um, so that's how the business started. And that was seven years ago. And we now work across um, a bunch of different sports and countries. And um, probably our sweet spot would still be football and rugby in the UK. Although, yeah, we do a lot of other sports as well. Cool. So I'm going to come to you first, Des, so you can unmute your mic. Getting a job. I know you mentioned, as soon as I mentioned this to you, you were like, oh, thank you very much, Rob, getting a job in, in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, cheers for that. Stitch, stitch is right up. But what would your advice be for people coming out of university, say a master's degree, because that seems to be the norm. What would be your advice for people who have who just gone, gone through the master's, coming out the other end, to actually get a job, get a job before the pandemic and maybe how things have changed because of it. Yeah, sure. Um, there is jobs out there. We recently advertised and, and I was talking to Matt Allen and Spurs. They recently advertised a huge number of people applying. Yeah, it is very competitive. So if you just finished a master's, really, you got to tick all the boxes, right? You got your qualifications, master's in strength and conditioning. That seems to be the, the, the basic now. Um, then you've got to get your accreditation. I need to know you've got your driving license because if you join a professional sports team, you're driving some very special cars. But that's only the baseline as well. And then you've got to get uh, experience. Okay, you've got to think about you as a coach, your philosophy, how you develop players, how you work with other people and, and learn off people and, and be mentored and be developed. Um, you've got to build up your community. Okay, who you hang around with, uh, who you bounce ideas off. You've got to have some achievements, even if it's just a, a poster presentation in the um, UKCA and you stand there. And I always go around the posters. I always chat to posters I'm interested in and you get to know people there. Achievements, you do a paper, you get a group together, um, you, you um, run a project, uh, you, you have ideas, you get ideas down on paper. Um, then you're ready for interview. Um, and the other area I'd, I'd really highlight to people, and I've interviewed a lot of strength conditioners over the years, is people need to dig deep into topics. We seem to be in an era of snippets, 
highlights, social media, um, nuggets of information. No, dig down deep, get the detail. I, I, I lost count the amount of people say, oh yeah, I'm into long-term athletic development. Talk to me. It gets to Rodri Lloyd's paper, Youth Physical Development Model, and then it stops. No, talk to me about Dietrich Hare. Talk to me about Kelvin Giles. Talk to me about Dan Baker. Talk to me about Jan Cote. Talk to me about participation and elite performance in long-term athletic development. Um, do you have a curriculum? Did you develop a curriculum? Talk to me about Sean Cummings' work in Biobandon and how uh, practical examples of managing maturation and athletic development. It's not there, that depth. And that depth comes from getting together, getting into groups, talking to people, um, initiative. So when we're looking for someone, we're looking for talent. We're looking for energy. Um, and we're looking for all those boxes to be checked. Um, there's so much you can do. Like, uh, in fairness to, uh, there's a Michael Mullen. He works in Leighton Orient. And during the pandemic, he simply started a group uh, through social media. And he called it the Irish Strength Conditioners uh, Group. Everyone's welcome. Uh, it just started <laughs> off that way. We don't want to do a Brexit or anything like that. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, he, he started a WhatsApp. He got together on Zoom weekly. It's gone to monthly now. But just that, getting to know people. And people in the group are presenting now, getting the experience of that. People in the group have invited yourself. You were on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can ask questions. They can learn. They can bounce ideas. So um, I'm waffling on now. But the basics are get accredited. And I can see, and Pawdy can see, and Perry can see the vast difference between a person that's accredited when they do a practical coaching assessment uh, in a job interview compared to someone that isn't. It isn't always like that, yeah, but it's a good marker. We know that if they're accredited, uh, they can coach in the gym, on the pitch, speed. Um, another area that, that could be an advantage if people uh, studied it more would be um, on-pitch periodization, planning, uh, working with a coach, understanding technical models, um, periodizing it on a pitch, uh, giving a coach guidance on the acute training variables and how he can overload a session. Um, it is a bit of a weak area, but if you spend time with a coach or an experienced strength conditioner or both that have worked on that area, that could be an advantage for you. Digging deep into LTAD, that could be an advantage for you getting into academy, networking with people, digging deep into each topic, having regular conversations and challenging questions, and um, that can help. Um, and getting you ready for it, a, a good mentor to review the work you're doing, to reflect, to improve, um, will help you get ready for that interview because they're challenging the interviews. We do a couple of rounds and we ask some pretty tough questions and, and we dig deep in the interviews. Um, but the community as well, when we're uh, advertising, I ring my contacts. Who do you know? Who's good out there? Who's talented? Um, so when you are mixing with people, show your, your best self. Um, and the more achievements you have, the more work you put in, the more uh, input into communities, uh, you, you'll be known. You'll bump into somebody that knows somebody, and then you'll be highlighted as a talented person. But it has to be a fair process in the interview, and the position has to be earned um, through the process. David, I'm going to come to you based on something that Des said, and that's... Um in-depth knowledge of what goes on the pitch and that makes me think of coaching qualifications and technical coaching qualifications for strength and conditioning coaches is that something that you feel that employers value i think someone like des does you know he's he's, he's obviously got a pretty rigorous process there and annoying because that means he doesn't need to use us but i, I think um you know you, you've got i think What's important is that you think about each role, not in isolation. So I imagine Des will look at the team around him that you got of strength and conditioning coach. You look at the team and go, well, what, where's the gap? And it, it might be a specific specialism um, technically. You know, and if you think about, I'm not a qualified SNC coach, but we will do SNC roles. And the point is, we get to a certain point in that. And then Des or, or somebody like him will, will do the expert kind of interview on site and we might be able to tap people on the shoulder who maybe wouldn't apply for example but I think you've got to decide we talk about this all, all the time you've got to decide what you're going to prioritize because if you look at a job description they'd have typically 25 to 30 things on them and very very difficult for anybody to be able to do all of that um, 
but it's much, much harder to assess an interview. So you typically, we go off five. Um, one's always cultural fit, um, but the other four are always open to uh, interpretation or kind of, and, and they would tend not to be, there might be one or two, there'll be technical skill, but there'll be other things. So how do you, um, how do you hire for potential is, is something that's, I think, especially around the diversity point at the moment, how do you actually get those people in? So if they haven't been given opportunities somewhere else, how do you notice that? And actually Des made a lot of the points about how you do that. You need a passion for an area and a thirst for knowledge. Um, but I think you've got to actually really decide what good looks like and the s &C skills, the coaching skills, um, they might not be exactly the same thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that actually answers your question, but I think, you know, it depends what you're looking for, really. Um, and Des could have maybe answer that as well. And I might, the poly is a certain Arsenal person. There'll be somebody that fits him well. And there might be, uh, he might occasionally go for somebody who is quite deliberately different to some of the other people, just to, because if you're not careful, you can get people who are the same. So Des, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, good, good points. I, I don't want uh, many Des Rhines. That would be, that would be painful for some, um, like, Paulie's very different to me. Um, the way Ivan coaches is very different to me. I'm doing a good bit of coaching these days and we're yeah. side by side yeah. on the pitch and I love the way he coach. Completely different to me. I'm a bit of a disciplinarian. He brings great energy on the pitch and I like that and I'm learning off him and he might learn off me as well. So when we do look, yeah, and we do insights uh, profiling and that gives us a clue. That's all to, to the personality type of the of the person and i'm a, a bit uh, red and i'm a bit blue detail and and i want things done quickly whereas i like the the yellow of ivan he wants to be involved bring people uh, beside him and the more variation the better for sure and i i every place is different how they look and what they look for and and i like the the attributes of someone who's uh, mannerly someone who's objective and someone who tells the truth and has the skills to tell the truth in the right way. Um, and when I ring around people, probably the first question is, is, it a, is he or she a good person? Um, does he or she cause fires around the place? Right now, technical and uh, the qualifications. Um, so being a good person and a good coach is, is the, the starting point. Because in big organisations with a lot of people, we don't want fires. I don't want to be dealing with hassle. Um, I want challenging questions and, and performance questions, yeah, but not, not difficulty in, in people who, who don't get on with other people, pretty much. Chris, anything to add? I was going to come to you on the experience side of things, because that's something people always struggle with, but fire away, what are you going to say? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely a mistake to come to me on the experience side of things, but I was just going to feed in on this and just say, I mean, the guys have got some fantastic points, but I mean, obviously the context of what they're talking about is very specific to football, you know, which is no surprise given Des's current role. But I guess to go back to your original question, which was about whether we should have coaching qualifications as well as trying to be strength and conditioning practitioners. If you take a sport like swimming, as an example, you know, we have technical swim coaches and a strength and conditioning practitioner probably spends almost all of their time um, in the weight room as that role, you know, so you're probably more of a strength and power coach. So if you're not going to go and get a swimming qualification, the very least you could do is go and stand on poolside and have a chat with your technical coach to try and understand, you know, how they're planning the training in the water. Um, and, you know, remembering that as a strength and conditioning practitioner, you're a support staff. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're not making Olympic weightlifters if they're swimmers, you know, we're there to support the technical coach and the athlete's development. So I think understanding the sport um, is really, really key. If that means you need to go and get a coaching badge and that's your decision, that's probably only going to help you. Um, but at the very least, you probably need to understand uh, the sport that you're working with as well. Des, come back to you. Yeah, and, and I like to uh, have the chats with the coach you're working with because the courses help. And I wouldn't say go very high and do a UFA or, or pro license, but yeah, at, at basic level one, level two for sure. But then the real gold is getting to know the coach, what his philosophy is, what his education is. Like um, I've worked with a few Dutch coaches in 
in Arsenal. And their background is Raymond Rahagan. So I read the book, did the webinars, went to his course and moving on quickly. That helped me <laughs> to um, understand them. And then I could share my philosophy with them and we could map, wrap the two of them in one. So having the skills to understand philosophies of coaches and then integrate it into your warm ups, explain why your other sessions and planning helps achieve what they're trying to achieve is very important. But you, you brought up an important thing, diversity. Um, I've been upskilling myself reading. Uh, there's a McKinley report, uh, and it's mainly businesses. It looked at 360 something businesses, and it showed with the greater diversity is the more 35% more chance of being above the, the median uh, financial gains for companies. So you're 35% more likely to make greater gains fi financially in businesses. So it's an advantage. And it's something we have to seriously look at in strength and conditioning. Most of the industry, like this group, is male and pale. And we need to type diversify and give opportunities, uh, give interview opportunities, give opportunities for an internship and to in increase the diversity. All right. So that's a responsibility on, on the likes of myself and others to do that for sure, because there's benefits to be gained. One little, oh, go on, David. I was going to say, yeah, there, there is a diversity point. You're right. But there's also an inclusion one. And I think the challenge that you have, and we see this a lot in, the, in quite a lot of the roles that we're doing, actually, not, not just SNC coaching as well, is that if you know, people won't apply to roles that they can't see themselves in. So, you know, there is a challenge um, for ads that you need to target all groups and environments that they feel comfortable in. And so that's a challenge for the whole industry is that how do you actually do that? And luckily for us, you don't need to tap them on the shoulder. <laughs> it's obviously our job. Um, but I think you need role models and, you know, the idea that you can't be what you can't see. It means that, you know, how do you give people the opportunities? And it's, you know, we've, we've run a couple of very high profile roles where somebody's got the role that maybe wouldn't um, be as qualified. Um, and it is, a, it is a challenge, but it's just one to be aware of, I think, for all of us. I'm not that this is about diversity particularly, but um, I think you just got to recognise that um, there is that challenge there for people to, to come in who don't see themselves in those roles. One little survey that I ran recently, 150 respondents from guys that work in British football, senior football, 13% came from a publicly available job advert, 13. So that was, all the rest came from either recommendations, um, promotion within the same organisation, or someone like like David, um, a headhunter or recruiter, is that is that an issue? Is that an issue because that leads to things completely opposite to what we're talking about, being diverse and inclusive? Because you're getting people like yourself who you know and things like that. Is that? Do you think that's an issue? I'll come to you, Des. Yeah, that doesn't sound good, and I was surprised uh, when when I heard it from you. And is that adult? Football. Yeah, so it's senior, senior football. Yeah, four English um, yeah. divisions and one Scottish. Yeah. So, I get it. It's it's a fast moving world up there, and when you have to fill a position, um, you could go to people you know, you could promote from within, but that is a bit of a lazy option. That's not good, and um, if it's not advertised, but if it's a senior position, yeah, uh, David. Um, should use should be used for that and uh, yeah you wouldn't need to go to advertising because you'll get so many um it, that should be a her, a search it should be a, a headhunt but a coach position a physio position it should be advertised and even we, we've been through it ourselves a few times when a pretty obvious candidate was within but when when we chat together it's okay we're going advertising yes you can do this role you, you can do this really well but if you go through this process you know you're the best in, in the country and wider for this role and you've earned it and you are the best person for it and you can go into it with confidence. So we should be advertising. It's a pity that the figure is so low because it does limit um, the correct decision maybe even. Yeah, and I think there, you know, there's clearly some work to be done, but I think having that criteria-based approach where you know it's very normal and, and coaching's the worst for it when we've been involved with some head coach roles where you know, people will throw in names and they've agreed on a name before they've even agreed why they want to hire somebody or what their criteria are. So, and they would have decided on the same person for different reasons. So I think when you come further down at the top, it's very hard when you're a senior role, if you haven't got the experience, the, the challenge is further down. And you, I think you need to look at it holistically within your group and look, okay, well, where, 
how can we, well, if you decide that you need a diverse workforce, how do you allow somebody with slightly less experience or where well, you can do it from, you can hire for potential. And that is from a five criteria, you can decide, you know, they don't have to have maybe as much experience, but um, yeah, that is a low number. What, Rob, what was the rest of the figures, do you know? So what was the, of the, oh, what's the other 87%? Don't want to put you on the spot, but. No, please do. Um... Isn't it? Yes, 13 available publicly available job advert. 37% uh, were recommendations. 35% uh, were promotion within the same organization. And then some small percentages came with, man came with the manager, um, moved with the manager. Um, what other ones were there? And I think, you know, the, the reality is, and it's something that for people to be aware of it on here, I imagine it's about, it's about a couple of things. It's about trust and it's about risk. So if recommendations mean that people feel like they've got a trusted advisor who they know they can lean on, which is absolutely the way it should be. So having a mentor is one way or somebody who can kind of vouch for you. Um, and then, you know, you have it in any, when you're buying anything, I guess, is that, that as you get closer to the purchase, um, you, there's a risk element that will, will I be seen as, as taking a risk on somebody? Um, and that's why personal recommendation is so strong. Or, or internal promotion is that we often run searches whereby, um, you know, we'll have internal candidates and externally people go, oh, come on, they just, they're just going to get given the job. Or, or internal people go, well, am I just in here just to make it the numbers? Like, no, you're not. Like, the fact is you're an advantage internally because if we say that every role is 50% cultural fit, um, you know what the culture's like here. So it is genuinely an advantage. It's also an advantage because of trust, because they know what you can do, even if somebody might be more qualified. So, you know, one recommendation of getting to a good club that you want to be in because <laughs> you have got hopefully an opportunity to develop. The flip side of that, if you stay somewhere for too long, I think there's a German saying that you're always being, always being an apprentice at your first company. Um, and there is a little bit of that as well. You can sometimes get undervalued if you stay somewhere for too long, but um, it's just interesting to know it's about knowledge for people on the journey of knowing how the system works. You're not going to change it overnight as much as we would like some of it to, uh, but it's just good for people to know. Fish, coming to you, I know it's, you said it wasn't good for you to answer, but I'm going to come to you anyway around the experience thing. And it's it was it came up a number of times in the questions that got asked upon registration was the difficulty of getting experience and people looking on job adverts and seeing X number of years experience and that seeming to be everywhere and then to get experience is, is quite tough. What do you recommend to your guys and what have you seen work along the way? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be this this guy, you know, but my answer is always going to be it depends. Um, you know, and everything is, as Des was, sort of, I think, said earlier, everything's kind of underpinned by context, isn't it? Um, I guess it probably depends if you're talking about undergrads versus postgraduate students to a, to a degree. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, I guess, almost misconceptions about the industry. Um, but, and I'm going to relate this back to your question, but I guess, firstly, in order to have a misconception, it probably means that um, you must have thought really long and hard about it being the actual industry that you want to work in. Because if you haven't, how could you have a misconception that you came up with from your own thought process? Um, and I'm not 100% convinced that, you know, undergrads, um, students who, or, you know, students who study an SNC or a sports science degree are 100% certain that it's even what they want to do. You know, I, I wasn't entirely sure. I did a geography degree at undergrad, <laughs> but I'm not that out there studying geography now. Um, and at the 18, 19, you know, I'm not convinced that everyone knows it's exactly what they want to do um, and that what they're focused on for their specific career path. Um, having said that, you know, what we do know is that from a really, really young age, so many of us love sport and we have an, an awful lot of sporting idols out there, don't we? You know, people kind of, as they grow up, think, oh, I'd love to be the next, I don't know, Mario Toge, um, or I'd love to be the next Mo Salah or something like that. So I think that students potentially, by the time they're 18 and they know they're not going to become a professional athlete themselves, they probably then look at something like strength and conditioning and, and think that, oh, if this is the career that kind of gets me to work with them, um, that's almost, you know, that's, that's great. And that's potentially almost the next best thing. So it's probably a bit of a misconception about glamour, 
you know, to a degree about it being a, a glamorous job. Um, and I'm sure Des has got more stories than me, but it's not a glamorous job, to, you know, being a, a strength and conditioning practitioner, far from it. Um, so I think, I, I think the earlier you can get your hands dirty um, and get out there and, you know, get some experience and, and let's, my suggestion would be to kind of, if there is an expectation that I'm going to go to uni or I'm going to try and get my experience at Arsenal, at Chelsea, at Saracens, my first piece of advice would probably be to remove that expectation um, and go out and get as much experience as you can, whether it be at your local football team, local rugby, local cricket team. Um, and let's not also, you know, devalue or turn our nose up at um, working with the general population who probably need this sort of stuff more than the athletes do, you know, because that helps you develop your rapport, your communication skills, your coaching skills. Remember, coaching is a, is a skill set. You know, the education, if you study hard, gives you the knowledge. But the coaching is a, is a skill in itself. It's something that is crafted and honed over time. Um, and the wider base or foundation of populations that you can work with, I think is probably going to help you just continually hone your craft. So I think that's one of the key things, really. It's a bit of an old chestnut, you know, like, oh, go out and get as much experience as you can. But I mean, I'd be really surprised if Des unmuted himself and told me that that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's um, that's definitely got to be one of the one of the key things. And from the university perspective, you know, universities have recognised this from an employability standpoint for a while. Um, and, and uh, you know, I guess most degrees probably now offer placements at years one, two, and three of undergrads, and and, and probably in the master's degree as well. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think from a uni's perspective, the quality of some of those placements. Um, you know, potentially could be better. You know, we could all probably do a little bit more at the university perspective to make those placements a little bit better. But equally, the students could probably be just as proactive at trying to go and find those opportunities as well, you know, to help kind of bolster and beef up their experience and their CVs. Sticking with you, Chris, while, while we're on the education and, and university theme, I mentioned another little stat, which is three out of four people in rugby senior well senior and academy rugby have got an msc or postgrad qualification um, on the survey that did 160 people in across australia new zealand and uh england scotland Ireland, and wales yep so just do you think that has led to better coaching do you think that's led to better coaches the the amount of people that are going through master's degrees <laughs> not Great specific question, to middle sex not yeah. specific yeah. <laughs> Great question. Did, did, I, did you hear me say it depends? <laughs> yeah, I look, I mean, I, I think my experience, and I can only talk on behalf of Middlesex, um, my experience really is that those students who are already working in a high performance or, you know, some kind of sporting environment, um, they actually tend to be the best um, academics as well. You know, which is uh, is not something you necessarily, you know, put two and two together. It's like a reverse of your question to a degree. Um, so I think those who are already working, um, I would like to think that, you know, the MSc and the PhDs that are being obtained out there, hopefully it helps with their decision making processes. You know, so in turn, maybe it makes them uh, potentially a more holistic coach, you know, so they know when to use data and when not to potentially. Um, so that maybe that makes them a better coach, you know, does doing a PhD um, help your coaching skills? Um, maybe not directly, but if it makes you a more rounded coach by helping your decision making um, in certain scenarios, that still makes you a better coach, right? I guess for those who undertake a PhD that's primarily in a laboratory, um, and therefore if they're not practicing as, let's say, um, a biomechanist or a physiologist, of which in my opinion, those specific job titles are quite rare now, unless you work, you know, at the English Institute of Sports, or if you worked, you know, at like a private laboratory at like, you know, Smith Smithkline or something like that. Um, 
it's probably not helping them to become better coaches if they're doing a bit of coaching on the side because their you know their academic education is primarily in a lab uh, and remembering that you know coaching is a skill so if you want to become a better coach you probably you know need to do some coaching which is why that old chestnut of go out and get experience and do some coaching is you know is, is probably quite valid um and it's also a process isn't it coaching's a process you know you don't become a fantastic coach overnight uh, we develop these skills over time so i guess the best way to you know continually hone your craft and get better is, is to keep doing it um yeah cool while we're on that i'm going to come to one of the questions that kind of falls into one of these points des and it was i know this is it's quite hard to again put context on it but all other things been equal how would you gauge someone that's been an intern at a professional club versus someone that's got first-hand probably maybe lead experience with uh, some professional football club for example who's a maybe a one-man band would you view those two experiences differently or just maybe just bring different things as an employer so explain that again um, yeah, a lead so ha- on his own in yeah, a pro a club on his own on a on a in a, in a semi-professional club for example mm. and a, or versus an intern in a professional club would they yeah. be two, two possibilities there for sure? Yep. I'm leaning towards the lead. Okay. The okay. person that has to organize stuff, the person okay. that has to deliver stuff. And as long as that person has someone to reflect with, bounce ideas off with, have a look at his or her sessions, that's really good. Now, an intern, if you aren't doing much, if you're observing, if you're doing the, the menial jobs, not going to learn as much if you're not chatted to brought through um what happened during the the last week um you're not going to learn a lot but to the same extent if you flip that and it's an intern and it's a good plan and there's people around more people to bounce ideas off you're given challenges those challenges are gradually pro- progressed um there's chats there's reflections there's what could you do better then you try that you might get a bit more with more people around you so it's down to who who implements it um, best. Um, mm-hmm. And there should be objectives for the person in the position to achieve it during their internship that may be missing from the one-man band. There isn't someone there to give you challenges and goals and objectives. There should be reviews regularly for the internship. Those reviews might be available for the one-man band. But if he or she finds the right person nearby in their community, maybe. Um, so you can make the best out of both. I like the idea of someone in charge of something, running something, doing something. Like in our our, our latest search for conditioner, uh, the person that got the job, I don't need to go into names, didn't work in a professional club. Uh, worked in a university. Um, great initiative in the person, in their learning, in their, their knowledge, in their development, and performed excellent in the interview and didn't need to go to a professional club, um, had their own company and did their grounding in the university and had good mentors. So any avenue can lead to a, um, a professional job in performance sport or academy sport if you hang around the right people and make the most of it. David, anything to add there? Yeah, I think you've got to be really careful to not make too many assumptions too early. So. It's something that's inevitable that you have to do if you've got, if somebody, if say 200 people apply, you have to narrow it down. So you need to kind of, you know, think of reasons for actually getting rid of people as opposed to adding. Uh, but equally, I think if you look, um, you want to look for people who've taken ownership of their own career, who've taken responsibility and are accountable for what they're doing. So, and have got a reason for why they're doing it. So um, if you do that, it's similar to the education point is that I can't imagine um, if you're doing a specialist PhD in a very specific thought, it would make you a better coach unless you're doing some coaching as well. I don't see, um, unless it's kind of directly, not to say that isn't a skill set that you want to develop. And I think on the education point, like, why are you doing anything? So I would say education is always good. We look for kind of lifelong learners. That's got to be a good thing. Um, but is it teaching you the right things? And, you know, so if you do a master's in an c and you're a physio, great, you're broadening your skill set. I think there is a bit of a gap like ex-players who go into the space or go into SNC, there's quite a lot of people that, you know, often there's a validation or a fear that they're going to be found out um, when others have a university degree and yet they don't realise that there's such great 
knowledge or things, skills they have. Sometimes they go down a, tr a trodden path, although there probably is a, a certain level that they need to get to. But I think, uh, to Chris's point, I, I think the most important thing is if it's giving you a different type of experience and there's a reason why you're doing it, then brilliant. But don't just do education as a tick box exercise. Don't do an additional master's or a PhD because you think it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think there's always a question of whether if you, if you, and it depends what you want to do with your career. Um, I think that's the other important. If you do, you have a plan for where you want to get to. And there's there'll be people at different stages of their career. There's undergrads to postgrad, and then further on, and, and where you go from there. But um, you know, if you go down a certain path, you might end up getting very entrenched in an area. Do you still have a broader way of thinking? And um, so, yeah, again, it depends, Chris. But um, <laughs> um, ownership is the most important thing. Are you in charge of your own career? To, to Chris's point about university internships, or maybe we're not doing enough. Well, the guy, guys and girls, who they should be taking ownership themselves. They should be going to Chris and saying, "Where are we? Oh, I've, can we find somewhere else for you?" You know, you need to do that yourself. And people who, who do that tend to be the better people, I think. Guys, we can add anything. Yeah, just um, I didn't do my masters till I was thirty-five. I, I left it late, and I. I was a bit embarrassed. I thought I'd better do one. And at least I did it on a topic I wanted to study. But if I had my time back again, I'd do it right at the start of my career. I'd do a part-time. I'd work and I'd apply the information where I'm working. And my assignments will be about what I'm doing when I'm working. So full-time, it's fine. But you mightn't have the time to coach, a lot of coaching. But I really like the idea of the part-time masters where you're coaching and studying and applying and linking your assignments to what you're doing day in day out i think that's a nice nice mix fish yeah I, similar to des really I, I didn't do my masters till i was 29 and then you know turned 30 when i was halfway through it um i, I think I, I agree with the guys completely and actually it kind of lends itself to something i said earlier which is actually my experience is believe it or not my the best academic students that I've typically had in the last five or six years are those that have been working. And Des hit the nail on the head for me. Like I say it all the time, have done for the past four or five years. In my opinion, the reason why they tend to be the best students is because they can take, hopefully, some underpinning knowledge, you know, on, on the Middlesex Masters, to use us as an example, that they didn't know before. And they know when they can go, you know what, that just doesn't work in real life. Or they can go, actually, I know when I can apply that. You know, and it's the experience of working that knows, you know, what Anthony Turner, I work with, says that, oh, the best coaches are thieves. You know, you can pick and choose little bits that help you formulate your own philosophy. Um, and if the best academics from a student perspective tends to be those that are already working, that probably, that as a concept, probably lends itself, similar to what Des is saying, to go out and do some work. Um, you know, after you've got your undergrad degree. And so actually, I, I guess my only ever so slightly different point to what Des was saying is from my perspective, I probably wouldn't go and do my master's degree straight after my undergrad. I'd go and do a little bit of work. I definitely agree with the part-time thing, do the master's while you're coaching, but at the very least do a little bit of um, coaching, do a little bit of work before you go on and do a master's degree. If you decide, like David says, that's what you need to go and do or what you, not what you need, sorry, wrong choice of words. That's what you want to go and do because it's part of the journey um, that you envisage is right for you. But isn't it better to do it later when you've figured out who you are anyway? So you're more authentically yourself instead of thinking you've learned. If you do it straight after an undergrad, you then think you're an expert when you're 23. 24 when you're not you don't even know who you are yourself possibly whereas as you learned who you were first and then I guess you could see some of the thinking and apply it to what you knew had already worked from your experience is that not a kind of more arguably a better way of doing it yeah fair points there yeah um getting that time um if I think back to when I graduated I didn't know Anton um I, I, I went to a university in London. I won't name where it is. I was so excited and leaving Ireland. And I, I researched it really well. I really knew what I wanted to do. And people who went there, uh, some brilliant PE teachers in Ireland, Vinnie Murray, he's passed away now, but he knew everything about sport, every, every rule, every training methodology, 
uh, Liam Salmon, another one. And I went there, but it was only two days a week. And um, I probably enjoyed myself too much in London while I was in university. So, yeah, I needed to learn a bit more about myself, get a bit more coaching done. Liam Hennessy pretty much was my master's when I started working in Connacht Rugby. And then, yeah, maybe two or three years out of undergrad would be a good time to do it. Fair points. Uh, good advice for people, in fairness. Are you going to add anything there, Bish? Or not? Are you done? No, not really. Yeah, just, yeah, pretty much just the same that, you know, my journey was the same as Des's. You know, I didn't do my master's till I was a bit later. Um, I'd done a couple of years in, in pro football. Um, between 2006 and 2008 and um, I, I personally you know I, I went to do my master's for a different reason actually because I'd been coaching um, for about seven eight years and um, you know I was I was doing it for a, a specific reason like David suggests we should um, but but it wasn't to go and you know get a job um, at a club I'd already done that and I was doing it for a different reason but I guess the point was I probably feel like I got more out of it having done some work in the field, being a little bit older. I, I definitely agree with that point about, you know, kind of uh, finding yourself. I think that's a little bit cheesy, that statement, David, but I like it. Um, and I is think- that what I said? <laughs> something like that, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. You can edit, edit that bit out, Yeah, Robbie. it's gone, it'll go. <laughs> yeah, can you make sure that's like got a strap line to a tweet? <laughs> David, it. But I think that's totally true in all fairness. Yeah, I really do. Just coming back to you, David, networking. Something that's, yeah. spoken, something that's spoken about a lot. Again, the 13% coming from a job advert, the, the rest coming from elsewhere. You need to build a network. What does, what does that actually mean? And how can people figure that out and do it, whatever it is? Well, I mean, I guess you want to... It, it's, it can sort of feel like a dirty word, but actually networking in the, in the context of what we're talking about, it's, it's really just exchanging of ideas and information. And I think as soon as you look at it like that, it does change it. So... Typically, you think of it as, as somebody who's extrovert, who's very good at going into a social situation and be able to talk. And, um, and people are very uncomfortable with it quite a lot of the time. But I think, and there are definitely some skills that you can, or um, rules that you can apply as to make it more comfortable. But if you go in with an open mind as to why you're doing it in the first place, I think, you know, why do you want to develop a network? And there's also no point building one if it doesn't work for you. You know, you should, there's nothing wrong with doing it for, um, for personal reasons, but equally you need to give something back as well. So, um, you know, and are, are, do you have a mentor or are there advocates for you who are out there? Um, I think there's loads of different tips that you can you can give people, uh, but you want to give it a fair amount of thought as to why you're doing it in the first place. Um, and it can either somebody maybe mentor you through your specialism. You might want to go outside and, and think about some people that you can go to who are in the sports or other countries. Um, and, you know, there's loads of different things, you, you know, if you're just consistent and nice and ask people for advice and offer to give something back and, um, you know, get out of your comfort zone, I think, then it's absolutely worth doing. And it's a, qu it's a quicker way. If you're at Arsenal with Des, that, if, you're, if you're in a club, um, I think, I, so often I hear it when people like move somewhere and they go, oh, I wish I didn't, or they leave somewhere. They go, I wish I would have used the opportunity to develop my network further because people do get stuck in terms of just delivering the work. You know, because because it's it can be all encompassing as we know. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just make sure that you have a plan and you have a reason for doing it, and that you give a little something back as well. Um, there's plenty of tactics and stuff out there you can read as to how you can do a good job of it. But I think the only advice I would give is just be just say thank you when you kind of do it, and there's nothing wrong with being persistent as long as you're kind of you have good manners. Yes, <laughs> just just a couple of examples. Um, there was this young man, um, he got in contact with me out of the blue. Um, he was very polite and he offered to share some information. He'd done some site visits of various sports and I was going, oh, that's refreshing. Um, often it's, days I can't get a job, what do I do? Um, whereas I'm interested in, what have you done? And this young man, I said to him first, have you permission to share that? Just check, uh, yeah, great. And I got such value out of his site visits to three different clubs and they gave me insights and I had chats with him and we stay in contact and he's gone down the psych route and he's, he's in, a, in a good place now. But I thought it was a good way to make contact with me. And then there's other really enjoyable ways. And he was more early in his career. Someone later in his career, I was at a conference. I bumped into um, Luke Woodhouse. He works in Wasps. 
-hmm. and she had the the manners and the foresight to say, Des, I pass St. Albans, do you mind catching up? And I had an enjoyable morning with him, sharing ideas, discussing um, the different environment of Premiership rugby and Premiership football. And I was delighted we networked in that way. So it's good to get to know people. But as as Dave says, two-way, share, not just, um, what can you do for me? Can I get a job? Offer something first. Offer the presentation of what they've learned from various different club visits rather yeah. than ask yeah giving first rather than asking first so well, i think you can you can fo Sorry. you can focus on learning first so don't look at it as gaining information like can i for me, me kind of develop something you want to identify some common interests so is there something that's exactly what this person did with theirs is that there's a common interest of, of site visits and therefore uh, or he can get something out of it as as well and, and from that you want to think about what you can give and if and there is an issue sometimes, I think, and, it, and you know, there's research on this um, around the, the more experienced you are, the more you think you can give. It's kind of inevitable, obvious research. But um, just because you're less senior, it doesn't mean you haven't got something to offer as well. You know, you have. Um, so, but just make sure you think about what that is. <laughs> you know, just, just plan up and prepare before you speak to somebody. Um, and if you do that, then, um, and equally, if you're, working, if you're more junior at a, at a club, um, you can still offer something for the club. So um, you could say you can go on some visits and bring the information back e equally. So um, yeah, there's just different different things that kind of make it easier for people to do because for a lot of people, it's not a comfortable thing. Mm -hmm. Chris, coming to you, one last point on the on the points that I've, the fired, I fired over before we dive into some of the questions. Accreditation, and, and Des has touched on it right at the start, the benefits of, of UKC accreditation, of various accreditations around the world because there's been a little bit of recent um, questioning, let's say, of accreditations. Apart from being the driving license, as, as Des described it, what is the point of accreditations and why should people value accreditations? Yeah, um, I mean, it seems very vogue, like you said, um, from a topic perspective. And I think it's, you know, crudely put, to ensure um, that employers and athletes are able to identify um, safe and competent coaches, you know, and, and Des's analogy of the driving license is bang on, you know, at the, at the UKSCA, we talk about it like that as well, really. Um, I mean, it's difficult to talk about um, NSCA or, or, you know, their accreditation process because, you know, it's, it's very, very different and, the culture and the dynamics in the States is very different to over here. But for our professional accreditation, you know, we choose some of the key, uh, I guess, key physical components that are likely to, you know, at some point be encompassed into SNC training programs. Um, and also some of the ones that are, you know, potentially hardest to coach as well. And this helps to ensure that coaches are competent at some of the more advanced training methods. Um, now it's an assessment of competency, the accreditation, which I think it does, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are competent because it's not quite the same thing. Um, so uh, the question then becomes, you know, oh, how do we become competent? Well, I, I guess exposure, you know, this, we're probably going to go full circle now back to the same answers, you know, but exposure to multiple coaching scenarios, getting the experience, the ability to hone our craft over time, um, which is essentially what coaching is. But the accreditation is, is there um, to differentiate between people who effectively are, you know, safe to practice, I guess would be the, you know, the, almost like the the buzz, the buzz term associated with that, really. Um, now, from an, again, from our perspective, <clears throat> we've had the same accreditation process since our inception in 2004. Um, it's it's probably about time, you know, that that was looked at. Um, you know, we've got Rich Clark on the board who's doing some some good work um, reviewing our current accreditation process, and um, you know, this is not about a UKCA, you know, mastermind or round table, but our accreditation, I think lots of people know, will now at some point, hopefully next year, when I'm currently, you know, right in the midst of working on it now, is gonna be encompassed as part of a 
um, chartership would be able to offer chartered status, chartered membership for our members and part of that UKSCA chartership will be our professional accreditation. And that's a really, really big deal. You know, it's not just that the accreditation is a big deal. We're also looking at our own processes and how we can make that a little bit more up to date, you know, um, by looking at um, just, I, I guess, almost embracing the gray areas of the accreditation, you know, almost like the paperwork for the accreditation as it currently stands is just tick boxes. Did they do this? Did they do this? Did they do this? And actually, even our own paperwork is probably not an app or as accurate a reflection of what actually goes on during the accreditation process. You know, there's dialogue, there's back and forth. Um, and it's about, you know, you can have um, differing opinions in a discussion, but someone can still be very safe and competent to go and practice, right? So we're looking at our own processes that can um, just be a better and more accurate reflection of, of learning you know essentially and assessing and giving feedback um but the bigger picture being that um the accreditation on its own uh which i think is is really good that the ukca i mean i have to say that but i also <laughs> truly believe it as well um it's going to be part of something even bigger moving forward which is you know really really exciting so actually what's the point of the accreditation for a safe and effective practice but actually it's going to be embedded in the future you know hopefully next year we can announce this something much much bigger um and that puts strength and conditioning you know again trying to put my own biases for the association aside i think that moves strength and conditioning um you know really up a notch from its professionalism standpoint because you know physios have been chartered for a while um you can be a chartered surveyor you can be a social worker, you can be chartered, an accountant, you know, um, it means something quite serious in the UK to be able to have access to use the Privy Council's Royal Charter um, and to get strength and conditioning chartered um, will be a really, really nice step forward and our accreditation will be encompassed within that. Cool. David, how do you, how do you think the, the industry values accreditation from an employer's point of view? I don't know. I mean, I <laughs> so I, I guess it's um, the reality is, is the way um, we work is that certain things are good. I think it's got to be a good thing you know, to, to Chris's point about um, the way society looks at certain things like this. And um, I, know, I know, you know, you talk about um, there's some talk about your know, physios are kind of a charters and, and SSC. for us, there's no difference. You know, the way we don't look at uh, you know, SSC slightly lower than physios. I know there's a debate about salaries and those sorts of things. For us, it's as professional and as serious. You know, that's the way we look at it. And I guess we often look at these things from a minimum qualification point of view. So in the same way that a master's might be the thing that, you know, the, the stats are up earlier in terms of how many people have them, three quarters, I think it might have been. So there might be minimum qualifications. We're then not looking for the minimum. We're looking for what separates out from the best. So I'm not saying it's not important. It clearly is um, for the industry. I guess where we sit in it, we're looking at what's going to be the best fit for a specific club at a specific time. And that's slightly different, I guess, where what our lens is. Um, not to say it's not vitally important, it clearly is. And it sounds like there's some great work being done in that and has been for a number of years. But I guess we also look at most people have to be accredited, what's going to separate out the specific few. And I guess that's where we end up. And um, not really a direct answer, but I guess that's where we mm -hmm. sit on the, on the thing. No, that's good. We'll, we'll dive into some of the questions. I just want to make sure we answer as many as we can without completely taking over your evening. But I can, I, I know based on our chat a few weeks ago, David, what the answer is going to be here. But would you say it's better to have experience in several sports or a large amount of experience in one sport? Well, that person needs to watch our chat, doesn't he? Or it she, does. Um, it does. I'll put a link. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, <laughs> my, my bias is towards people who've got a diversity of experience you know i think you're going to learn a lot more unless you've been particularly lucky to be at a specific sport that has had loads of change or um if you've been but if you've been in one place surrounded by the same people in one environment it's highly unlikely that you'll have that diverse of view of the world it's just um, i mean you might but um if you without knowing anything else about the people i would highly recommend somebody who has done more things in more sports because you'll get different views like you know, we were joking before um, before we came on. Uh, Des, when I moved to Ireland to play rugby, when Des contacted me, I came from playing rugby in the Premier League, in Premiership in England, 
which, and I was so arrogant to think this is the way you do things. And then you go over to Ireland and it was completely different. And I became a better player there, but from doing things that I didn't think we would have done. So you do, you, you get blinded by your thinking, by your own importance almost in one environment. So I think any opportunity to go somewhere else in a different sport has got to be to the benefit of your career. Des? Yeah, it, um, it's, it can only be advantage. It can be enjoyable. It can get you out of your comfort zone. It can develop you in, in many different ways. Like, like recently I did some uh, consultancy work with India cricket. I know nothing about cricket. <laughs> I've never even seen a game. But I was there, right, out of your comfort zone, Des, do a bit of studying, watch a few games, get your thoughts together, get your ideas together, make sure you can have a conversation with the coach, know a bit more about cricket now. And I enjoyed it just for that challenge and the different duration of the games, the different demands of the game. It was fascinating for me, out of my comfort zone, learnt. Um, and yeah, it can only but be but good and you can transfer things easily. And the basics are the same, no matter what sport it is. Um, from Gaelic football to hurling to soccer to rugby to cricket, um, it, they're very similar principles. Fish? Yeah, I just, yeah. Des has literally just stole my thunder in that final line, if I'm being honest with you. I just unmuted myself and then I didn't want to mute again to look stupid. But my, my point was just going to be, we've had students in the past, you know, go, oh, I'm, I'm desperate to work in football. You know, that's the classic one we hear all the time. But they don't realise that, just exactly as Des said, really, I'm just repeating it, you know, that knowledge and skills, you know, some of them, and, and not just a few, a good chunk of them are transferable, you know, if you want to go and work in rugby or go in cricket. So... Um, you know, we're always we're always hearing people, as David was kind of sort of half alluding to earlier, about people saying, "Oh, you know, are there opportunities out there?" Well, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself and make it harder for yourself. <laughs> you know, by saying, "I only want to work in this sport." Um, so, yeah. Well, just coming back to you, Des. Chris Black, is there a stigma in football about employing SNC coaches from other sports like rugby, maybe due to perception? false perceptions uh, maybe 10 years ago maybe five years ago but now i think with the likes of of bryce yeah. who david recruited i think there we go uh, who's been very successful in english football um is one example but there's more uh, we've a good few in arsenal we've had a good few in arsenal um and ben rosenblatt in the fa as well um some very good stories, some very good successes by people from other sports coming into football. Uh, in the past, yeah, maybe it was, uh, you don't know the game and all the usual, but because there's more people, not just in, in science and medicine, on boards, in directorships from different backgrounds, environments, they're seeing the value in it. And it's, it's, it's definitely increasing. And, and another um, premiership club, I won't say the name, contacted me asking who did I know out there? Because they were recruiting and they wanted a rugby person because it was a specific position based in the gym uh, uh, and they wanted to focus a bit more on strength and power. And they were actively looking for someone with that background. So it's slightly changed. Yes, in the past, it may have been like that. And people, not everyone, have seen the benefits of it. I do. I think it fits well with a team of people. I think it would be a massive challenge for a person from a different sport to step into football in a single position, a lone position. Um, they would want to be on their toes, really know their stuff uh, to get going. But uh, we look for that diversity where we are. There's many different sports and that, that helps us um, in Arsenal. We've had people from rugby, Olympic sports, uh, cricket, um, many sports, athletics. Um, and the balance is half of the people with a football background, half the people different, and it creates really good things. Just sticking with you, Des. Daniel Greenwood, how do you make the most when you're interning somewhere? Any good examples of interns at your place that have done specific things that have... Yeah, yeah, this? sure. Definitely. It, it, it came to mind that the interns got to be polite and mannerly, but demanding. Um, look for regular dates in the diary to sit down and chat. Um, that should come anyway, but do look for it because people are busy. I can be busy and I, I may miss those opportunities. And then you've got some targets. Then there may be a project given to you. So an intern we had recently, and we only do paid internships, is um, a goalkeeping project. 
and he did a really good job at that. And that was alongside the coaching responsibilities he had. And his, one of his objectives was to get to UKCA as well. And so he had these objectives to, to look after the 13s, look after the 14s, do your UKCA, run a goalkeeping project, help us all out in all the other age groups and all the other roles and responsibilities that you have. And we'll check in regularly. Now, Perry did most of the mentoring with that specific uh, conditioner and he did a great job with him and the goalkeeping project was a success the accreditation was successful and he, he did, um, did very good uh, delivery and coaching in the age grade so projects objectives reviews um, and making the most of chatting with people while you're in the environment Chris I'm going to come to you a couple of questions on too many coaches so too many graduates and not enough jobs, therefore le leading to people moving away from the industry, losing talent. Is that a concern? Um, it, well, I guess just to hone in on one of those bits, who says they're talented? Who, yeah, no, it's, just, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a question, you know, like I guess um, if, if one of the questions is about, you know, our coaches leaving the industry, um, yeah, it's incredibly competitive, isn't it, right now? Everybody knows that. Um, but I think Des touched on it a little bit earlier, you know, in the sense that there are opportunities out there for sure. It comes back to that perception, doesn't it, you know, of pigeonholing yourself and only wanting to work in or thinking that you only want to work in one area. Um, you can definitely get coaching experience out there with university teams, local teams. That definitely exists. Um, I think probably the biggest financial market in strength and conditioning is in that sub elite level. And actually, uh, just to, without going off on too much of a tangent, you know, before I started full time at Middlesex in whenever that was 2013, you know, I, I did a couple of years in professional football. Uh, the club went into administration. Uh, I lost my job and I still owed money to this day. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to get back from that club. Um, but I then to went and work in the private sector. I worked um, for a big physiotherapy company and I kind of over a period of time then started heading up the performance side of that business. So it's a UK company, obviously. It's kind of got that Exos type model, just nowhere near as big, I guess, if you like. Um, but, you know, I had to go out and fight for contracts and to justify my salary. And um, that was probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. You know, I did it for about four and a half years, something like that. And I was employed. And in order to get paid a certain amount of money, you know, I had to go and win contracts. You know, I had about a couple of them, which were worth about 20 grand. And I had about another three or four of them, which were worth five grand each. You know, most of them were not big, but, you know, bring in. 55, 60,000 pounds a year, and I can now justify my salary. And being in that environment, um, you know, I've still got my very, very diverse populations that I'm working with. I had a little contract with a local tennis club that was five grand. I had a little contract with a local athletics club, which was five grand. Uh, actually, a little story, and, and apologies if this comes across as a shameless plug, but I'm not a day to day coach, so this shouldn't come across as a plug, actually. This is just genuinely a story. I trained a girl called Sabrina Bacare, who um, won the gold at the World Youth Games for 400 metres. She's actually the fastest ever 400 metre athlete at under 18 level uh, GB's ever had. Way faster than a Horigu at that age, way faster than Shake Straight and Sally Gunnell at that age. Um, and that came from that little five grand local athletics club at Luton. You know, there's loads of opportunities out there for Coke. That's a true story, by the way. There's loads and loads of opportunities out there. Um, I just think people are maybe a little bit too, you know, obsessed with, you know, I mean, I can't imagine how many phone calls and email, not phone calls, how many emails Des is going to get off the back of this, you know, people going, oh, how do I get into Arsenal? <laughs> and really, you know, it's, um, I think the best thing, you know, for Des to take note is, well, if you listen to what he said, offer him something first and then, uh, you know, broaden your skill set. I just pick up, all, I know Des has unmuted himself. I just got one more thing to say. Sorry, Des. Um, I, I don't think the CV, and maybe, you know, definitely David, I'm sure, will have something to say about this. I don't think the CVs do much for differentiating people now because you touched on it in your questioning, right? It's a saturated market, which means everyone's got the MSC. 
everyone's working towards the professional accreditation. Really, your differentiating factor, um, if you know that you have to do an application, is probably the cover letter. And in the cover letter, you probably need to be, you know, Des was talking about accomplishments earlier at the very beginning of this. And he was talking about, oh, have you done like a UKSCA poster? You know, for me, an accomplishment that is a real world example in your cover letter is probably really valuable, you know? Um, and talking about whether that be a specific case study um, of you working in a specific scenario environment with a certain athlete or athletes and things that you've achieved and the cover letter can talk not about, oh, I achieved this, but, you know, what you've learned from the process and how you did it. Um, and I guess one of the key things in a cover letter is not to be afraid to be really, really honest. You know, there's probably too many of us sort of, you know, historically, I I'm, I'm definitely wouldn't have been any different when I was younger, sort of blowing our own trumpets, thinking that's what people want to hear. People don't want to hear that. Yeah. There's. Yeah, just don't give up on industry. Do not. It's a growing industry. The chartership. Um, I'm working on a on a I'm on a sports science working group at home with Gaelic games. That's growing. Um, if you're passionate, if you're hungry, uh, if you got the talent, um, there's jobs out there. Definitely, even in these times. The last few weekends, I go for my little walk in in a park nearby, and there's these military fit um, sessions. And they're crowded, they're packed out of it. And I know a conditioner, competent, qualified, will do a better job. No disrespect to the um, session that was going on with military fitness. But if there was a young person with initiative, they would do really well. With that, just that area, in that park, with those groups, they would get sessions that are, are individual, that are fun, that are challenging. Um, they do really well. Um, there's... 100 houses near me. You could create a full-time job out of the 100 houses near me with the community around here. Guaranteed, if you've got the initiative, if you've got the passion, if you've got the hunger. Um, you don't have to think about the, the elite level all the time. I'm thinking about my session tomorrow with the under 12s. I can't wait. It's the funnest thing I've done for, for many a time. It's more fun and more enjoyable, more fulfilling than the few times I worked with the Irish rugby national team. Undoubtedly. So... It's not always what you think working at that top, top level. It can be way more fulfilling working at, at other levels in athletic development, in strength and conditioning. There is jobs out there. If you've got the passion, the hunger, the talent, there is jobs. They won't give up on the industry. I'm going to come to you, David, because there's a couple of questions about CVs and cover letters, and, and Bish mentioned it there. Can you shed some light on what employers, I mean, this is a huge general question. It, it can depend and all this kind of stuff, but any hints and tips for people on CVs and cover letters? Yeah, I mean, Chris made the point around, um, I, and it's, it's probably worth pointing out that we, a lot of the work we do would be headhunting people more senior. So we do quite a lot of that, although we do still for a number of roles, we will, so the FA would be one of our big clients to where they will also, will get a number of people apply as well. So we'll be, we'll take 100, 200 people, um, you know, and I think, just take a bit of care to start with, you know, check that you spelt things right on it and that it's all in the right way. So there's a, there's a good start, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be overly long. Once you get past three pages, it's too long. Um, this isn't really all a CV is an opportunity to get to meet somebody or to get to the next stage. That's really, if we're running it anyway, that's what it is. And then a covering letter, like Chris had hit the nail on the head actually, just around be honest and you don't have to know the, all the answers to everything, you know, you, you can be humble and you can, but tell your story, you know, because that's what we try and get out of people. We try and get out of people's stories, something that's believable and authentic. And it's not necessarily the most qualified or the best um, coach or practitioner. It's the one that you engage with most, the one that you believe most, the one that you think you can trust. So actually people being human, is the biggest strength um so be that in a covering letter now i had an interview today with somebody and they told me an unbelievable story that was quite a, and they didn't mean to do it it was just something that was part of their life and you go i would trust you because of something that you just told me that you don't know that you even realize that you told me so i think you know i oh can't a great quote you know you've got to be yourself because if you don't who are you being and how will you remember 
<laughs> you know, so um, it's difficult because I think people do feel sometimes that they need to be something um, to get a role. And as I think Des has, has hinted, you don't, you know, everyone is different. And um, so, yeah, that's the thing. Just just try and come off the page authentically and, and, and tell your story. Des, anything to add? Just, just remember that story we chatted about with a CV. There was a, a young man, he sent in a CV with a photo of him and he was standing there with a bottle of Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, and also, sometimes in CVs, people say they're UKC accredited. We do check. And if you do that, it doesn't look good. But you'd be surprised out of about 100, there'd probably be five people that would do that. Um, and we do read every CV, but we'd get about 250. I was talking to another person from a Premier League club. He got 365. He got, no, I do read every CV, but get the education, get the experience, get the qualifications early. Um, some people could lose interest if you're reading that many CVs. Get the big detail out clear and, and front and centre. There's, there's actually some kind of quite good eye tracking technology around how people read CVs and you do have to get, like, you know, don't waste the first half of the first page on your address. You know, it doesn't matter. Put it at the bottom of the end page or your phone number. You know, you know, you, you want to get to the point quickly. You want to be like, okay, oh, personal statement. You want to get academic qualifications probably. So the stuff that, and then make, we try and say as a rough rule, whatever your role is now on, on the first page, as well as a personal statement and qualifications. So you go, right, okay, we know this person's a certain level, a certain level that is applicable or uh, suitable for whatever role it is so you want to get past that you, you don't want people to go no immediately um and then second page you go into a bit more detail but there is kind of technology around what people look at and it's first page it's then very quickly go through the second or third page then they look at in other interests so um i can't i don't know what that study is i'll see if i can find it because i can send it to the group but um there is work that have been done on that so the other interests can be a way to differentiate you so if you have gone up mount everest or you have you know raise 50 grand for a friend who got cancer or that stuff does matter and that makes people more real and more personable so don't think it doesn't matter don't put reading in the cinema you know because um you know you know well, seeing so like something that actually shows that you've done something for somebody else possibly or that it just makes you stand out chris yeah i was just going to say that guy with the heineken probably sounds like he'd be a good fit for middlesex <laughs> <laughs> Loves, the read, loves reading in the cinema. Pretty didn't love reading, but maybe likes the cinema. He was really good at Excel. He'd fit in great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone over time. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but I've taken a picture of them, so um, we'll maybe get to them at some point in some of them, on some of the medium. But um, thank you very much for your time, guys. Thank you to the 90-plus people that have, um, that have stuck around and slowly dropping off. But um, thank you very much for giving up your evening and having a chat. And uh, no doubt I'll speak to you all soon. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, guys. Cheers.